Very good. Let's go. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for meeting with us and uh, agreeing to talk to us and let us come and be part of your worship service tomorrow night. Uh, looking forward to it. I'd like to hear you just tell the story of, of uh, how this church began. And I know it goes back at least your grandfather, is that right? Yeah, my grandfather in the, probably the early 60s came into, you know, began to get in Serpent Handle. He started out in Church of God and then got in Serpent Handle, went to Pentecostal, and then the Lord revealed to him uh, the oneness. And so once, once he got into that, Nobody wanted nothing else to do with him, so, you know. Mm. They were having house meetings uh, from probably mid-60s up into the 70s. And uh, in 1977, my aunt had a house out almost where the end of the parking lot is next to the road. She told them, she said, when I die, she said, I want my house tore down, the property leveled out, and a church built. And so in 1978, probably around June or July, they started building the church. My grandfather was here until 86. He had congestive heart failure and passed away. Uh, another man took it over. They set him in pasture, and he had took up serpents, and, and you know, a wonderful man. Uh, but in 87, a woman was rattled a bit. Her daughter came in, pitching this big fit, made her go to the hospital, and they got scared, took serpents out. So from 1987 to 1990, serpents were here. Excuse me. And my dad, in 1990, July, he said, okay, homecoming, or homecoming the first week in August, he said, homecoming, serpents will be back. This church was founded on that, and they're coming back. That night, half the church left, split. Hmm. So we dwindled down. Well, at that time, I hadn't even got in church. I didn't get in church until uh, December of 90 when I got married. But uh, church membership was down to family, which was about seven or eight people. And uh, then when I got in church, you know, they were already having serpents back. And it went on. Dad never, he said he never was a pastor. So what are you? He said, well, I'm just over it. I'm, I'm not called to be a pastor. I said, well, okay. So in July of 1994, we were up here getting ready for home, come doing something in church, and we walked out on the porch. He said, uh, I've got something for you to pray about. Instantly, <laughs> I knew what it was. I mean, it just, God just had to show me. I said, I don't want it. He said, you're the only one that can take it. So well, I don't know about that. I said, let's pray. So we prayed. Fleece the Lord in something that come past. And so I took pastor in 1994. The following year, we had a woman get bit. Uh, homecoming on Sunday. Died at the house on Tuesday. Hmm. So it was, a, it was a rough first year, and, and I was 23 years old, trying to take care of a church, have people here three times my age that didn't want to hear what I had to say. But God worked it out. Next year I'll be 20 years. I'm hanging up. Well, congratulations on the big anniversary. Yeah. But it's it's been a tough job. But now, you know, I, I count it a privilege just to be a pastor, to be over a flock of people. What, uh, ha questions about, you know, attendance, and you are talking about it was about seven or, seven or eight at one time. What kind of a, attendance do you have today? Right now we're bringing in probably regular members is, 24, 25, 26, somewhere, you know. I've never really counted exactly, but probably about 25. Of course, we have visitors. We have some, you know, come from other churches or some that have came since the show's come on. And we'll have Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes, you know, 35, 40 people. But when Wednesday night comes, you know, that, that midweek service when you're needing somebody to count, a regular 20, 25 members. I understand that. We had our Wednesday night service, prayer service this Wednesday, and you get the the fewer you, there for you, that. You've got your there. faithful few on That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Good man, good
I, I remember a husband, he's the same age as me, we were in school, but kind of didn't run in the same quicks, you know, but uh, she told me her husband was, and I said, well, you know, that's good. So she come a few times, and he came. And now, you know, he, he writes on Facebook after every service what a wonderful service did, and how he felt the spirit. And, and uh, so they've been here faithfully, and then last Sunday had a woman contact me on Facebook, and they live in Morristown. And she contacted me about 9.30 Sunday morning. That's what time service was. I told her they were here. And then uh, Wednesday, he only had to work half a day for some reason, so they were back Wednesday night. And they said it. they had moved from Knoxville to Morristown. The church they went to in Knoxville had split, and they had nowhere to go. And he said he'd been to a few churches, and services were dead. He said we were looking for something more. So Sunday they said they enjoyed service, and sure enough, Wednesday they were back. So that might be, you know, another small thing. I expect there's been very few people that accused you of, of your church of being having dead services. I would think. Well, no, unless unless they're here on some of the Wednesday nights when nobody wants to do nothing, then they'll <laughs> they'll say, well, yeah, these people are the same way. You know, I mean, of course you're going to have it anywhere, but but I do tell my people, you know, let's try to stay prayed up. I have drove to Georgia, West Virginia, Alabama, you know, four to seven hour trips to be in a service and get there and nobody won't do nothing. And you're thinking, I wasted my gas. And I said, I don't ever want anybody to come here and feel like they've wasted their gas coming because nobody wants to get in. You know, if they come ready, you know, wanting to get in, and, and they see nobody in this church moving, it's not likely they're going to get up and do something. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and and I, I'm very appreciative to my people that they press, they, they try to get in, you know, they, they push. My son, bless his heart. Uh, little Cody. Little Cody, he handles fire a lot. That fire bottle right there and that propane torch. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't take medicine. You know, he, he does, well, he has been a little bit lately taking stuff for science, but he went for about two years. He didn't take nothing, no medicine for anything. And he handles the fire by faith. And he's told me, you know, Dad, there's been times that service has been slow and I want to get things started. And he said, I light up the fire bottle to try to get people to get in. And he says, when you light that fire bottle up and you're just wanting people to get in, he said, it'll burn for four or five seconds and it quits burning. He said, you know, you're a hell fire when I'm like, no. I don't want that four or five seconds of burning before it starts not hurting. <laughs> but, I mean, there's, there's some that willing to push and get in and get the same with everything they've got. You know, if the first song won't do it, the second song won't do it, they'll sing three or four. And sometimes they will give up, but there's times that they'll sing enough that people will try to get in. And and that's that's that, to me, is what it should be about. I and mean, we should come to the house of God given everything we've got. Well, that kind of leads me into the, a question that uh, we'd actually talked about, uh, my wife and, and uh, our family, uh, about wondering how, uh, I know this is kind of probably a hard question to, to, to answer, but how do you know when the Spirit, or sense that the Spirit is telling you that now is the time to pick up uh, a snake or to light the fire or whatever? Well, I mean, everything in God's Word is done by the self-same Spirit. It's, it's all one anointing. It's just whatever you feel the Lord, feel the Lord speak to your mind to do. You know, I mean, I, I felt the anointing before and just feel real good and just ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And, and not actually feel like doing anything. Just stand and cry and praise Him. And, but then there's times that He'll say, you know, uh, it's all right to take up a serpent, or it's all right to handle fire, or it's all right to bring the deadly thing. You know, and then, of course, I'll pray a minute or two longer to make sure that it's not just me wanting to do it. But, you know, it's it's just what you feel the Lord speaks to your, your heart to do when, when you're feeling that. Moment. 